few months ago, I gathered over 50 different 3D filaments and I showed off their special powers by turning each one into a Benchy boat. I called that episode every filament, but let's be honest, it was a lie. It was more like every kind of PLA. And even then, no, it wasn't. The micro center here in Denver, Colorado carries over 200 filaments, but even they barely scratch the surface. Well, I scratched. I scratched it like a scab until the filaments poured out. Filaments too rare and too advanced to buy here. For months, I've been scouring the web and calling in favors, sourcing a filament in every single material I could find. This is a filament that prints hotter than a soldering iron. This one's softer than a string. This one is made of more wood than plastic, and this one isn't even a 3D printer filament at all. That just leaves one final challenge. How the hell am I gonna print all this crap? This question is rendered rhetorical by today's sponsor, E3D, London, England's premier purveyor of business ends for the world's finest printers. Prusas use E3D parts, Lulzbots use E3D parts, your printer probably uses E3D parts, but E3D saves the best for themselves. Behold the Tool Changer and Motion System, an experimental printer platform with four extruders and a receiver that can swap between them mid-print. I broke this machine down in depth last episode, but quick recap, we have a direct drive hammer with a volcano hot end for high speed printing. In the middle is a matched pair of hammers for multi-material jobs and important for today's episode, a liquid cooled Titan Aqua with a 65 watt heater and a hardened steel nozzle X. Let's kick this off with one of the highest performance materials humanity has ever invented, Peak. When properly printed and annealed, polyether ether ketone is twice as strong, 10 times as stiff, and softens a full 60 Celsius hotter than Tolman 910, the toughest filament from the previous episode. Peak's resistance to impacts, moisture, heat, abrasion, fire chemicals, high pressure, steam, and even radiation are so far off the charts you can't even see the other plastics. Harnessing this power is not easy. This material, like many of these other super polymers, prints at 400 degrees Celsius, a full 150 degrees above my Prusa Mark III safe operating temperature. You're going to need a 140 degree bed and a 100 degree heated chamber, and well, the nozzle is over 80 degrees hotter than a soldering iron. Second, this is a $9 Benchy because Peak costs 600 US dollars per kilo. But the fun begins before you start printing. To dry this filament, you have to bring it to 120 Celsius, a full 50 Celsius hotter than a food dehydrator. That is zest enough to melt polycarbonate, which means you'll need to transfer the filament to a metal spool to wind it on or the spool itself will melt. Finally, glue stick and tape don't hold at 140 Celsius, so you're going to need to get yourself a special heatproof bed treatment like Vision Miner Nanopolymer. Because of the cost and complexity, Peak is for the most unforgiving parts that are too intricate to mill out of metal. You'll see it used for pressure fittings, gears, bearings, engine parts, aerospace, and even firearms. High temperature plastics are also used in medicine and biochemical engineering because you can sterilize them in an autoclave or radiation chamber. Peak is one of the stiffest printable plastics around, but sometimes you want it stiffer. Peak is hard to print, but sometimes you want it harder. If your 3D printing predilection tends towards the sadomasochistic, abandon hope and enter the carbon fiber peak. CF Peak is the same super powered super polymer, except it's infused with chopped up carbon fibers. This makes this quite possibly the stiffest printable plastic possible, and the carbon fill pushes Peak's off the charts heat resistance even further into outer space. The trade off in every way a plastic could be a bitch to print, CF Peak is bitchier 410 degree nozzle, 150 degree plate. But the fun starts before you even put it into the printer. You see, Peak was as rugged on the spool as it is in the print, but a reel of CF Peak is as brittle as Linguini. When I dehydrated the stuff at the manufacturer's recommended temperature, it went completely ballistic, and half of it is now a useless bird's nest that costs 650 bucks a kilo. I think it took on more water than it was supposed to, and when I threw it in this convection oven, it like puffed up like a carbon fiber filled Cheeto. Dangerously abrasive. Luckily, I split the sample in half in case something like this happened, but I still wasn't out of the woods. The only feature I didn't add to Scorporus is a runout sensor, so I had to babysit it for five straight hours. Why so long? Because this stuff is so prone to jamming that your top speed is 10 millimeters a second. Carbon fiber of course reams out a brass nozzle, but don't just reach for the big iron on your hip. 410 Celsius is hot enough to anneal hardened steel. In other words, this will unharden your nozzle. 
This would have been the perfect time to bust out the Olsen Ruby, except if you let CF Peak cool in your nozzle, it shows its other superpower permanently clogging nozzles forever. E3D sent me at this Nozzle X specifically for this filament. It's made out of a special tool steel that stays tempered above 450 Celsius. If you find yourself in a situation that calls for extreme strength, extreme stiffness, and extreme temperature resistance in your 3D print, just screw 3D printing and mill it out of aluminum. If you're not allowed to use metal, your boss is probably setting you up and you should join a union. At 650 bucks a kilo, this slightly beats Vanilla Peak as one of the most expensive filaments. But what is the most expensive filament? What is the Black Lotus of plastic spirals? That dubious honor goes to Peak's brother, Peck. Polyether Ketone Ketone is made of the same building blocks as Peak, just arranged in a different order. Peck nearly matches its older brother's strength and resistance to chemicals, and even has a slight edge in terms of heat deflection. It does need annealing to tap its true potential, and as it warms, you get to watch it shift from a glittering crystal clear to a milky opaque, a property I don't think I've seen in any other filament. Peck Peak... Peck Peak's a little print... Peck prints a... Ah, ah. Peck prints slightly cooler than Peak, you can run it a little faster, and it's friggin' better, it's 700 US dollars a kilo, making this the most Gucci spool of plastic that money can buy. Peck has one absolutely critical edge that sets it apart from other super polymers. It's one of the easiest materials to print. I'm not just comparing this with other 400 degree space alchemy either. That is an easy W because the others are, are kind of a, a, a challenge. Peck doesn't warp, dimensions come out crisp, and it does some pretty freaking good overhangs and bridges for filament that comes out of the nozzle at 380 goddamn Celsius. I put this stuff on par with PETG in terms of printability. On a hobbyist workbench, uh, just get a new printer and 16 kilos of PLA for your 700 bucks. But if you're in a defense contractor's R&D lab or on board a space station, this is exactly what you want. So what if your print doesn't have to be unbreakable, but you do want it to be on everything elseable? Then the material you're looking for is PSU. This ain't a power supply unit, it's polysulfone. I have no idea where the U comes from. This stuff isn't quite as strong as Peak, although it's still extremely strong, and it's not as easy to print as PEC, but it's still fairly easy. PSU excels in harsh environments. It can resist automotive fluid even at boiling temperatures. Its glass transition temperature is above 190 before annealing, and this stuff withstands radiation better than almost any other polymer. This gives you the perfect material for anything that has to be sterilized, autoclaved, uh, or I guess fired into space. Why not? Fire your print in this space, see if I care. This stuff is cheap enough that you can print stuff like car parts, RC components, medical and culinary prototypes, even lab equipment that otherwise couldn't be safely made on a 3D printer. It also has an extremely high dielectric constant, which makes it a natural choice for super high voltage projects like Tesla coils. There's one final word of warning. I left my PSU sample in the dehydrator a little too long, and it developed these weak spots that caused it to spontaneously crumble apart. Amorphous polymers like PSU, ABS, PETG, and polycarbonate will crystallize like this if they're overheated, especially if they're also waterlogged. I might be able to recover this stuff by warming it overnight and allowing it to cool slowly. This type of issue is better prevented than solved by just keeping an eye on how long you've been dehydrating it instead of just running it for like a week. PSU, like Peck and Peak, has its own close printable relative, PPSU. Polyphenol sulfone used to be a proprietary Stratasys product. As you will discover in the next episode, hit subscribe if you're interested, please! Stratasys materials can run in other printers once you free it from its stupid overpriced canister. PPSU, though, is slightly stronger, stiffer, and denser than PSU, and it elevates its brother's super duper heat resistance to truly ludicrous levels. Its glass transition temperature is 210 freaking Celsius. Like, the same temperature that that would liquefy PLA will barely soften PPSU. You could almost print a nozzle that prints PLA. I found it tricky to dial in the print settings for PPSU. A few degrees too cold and layers flaked apart, too hot and it got all blobby, too fast and the walls were wobbly, and too slow and bridges sagged like crazy. But once I had the temperature and speed locked in, my PPSU Benchy turned out to be one of the most handsome on this episode. The surface is nice and slick, which means it traps fewer germs and other crud, making PPSU the superior choice for anything that has to be sterilized. Ignore that layer split, it doesn't exist.
PPSU shares its brother's resistance to chemicals, impacts, and ghoulifyingly large doses of radiation, but let's be honest, at $200 a kilo, you're buying this stuff because you want the heat resistance. But what if instead of heat, you want to min-max on chemical resistance? Well, smurf it up on the next branch in the family tree, PPS. Polyphenylene sulfide is the ultimate chemical resistant filament, so if your project has to resist acetic acid, acetone, ammonia, benzene gas, butyl acetate, calcium chloride, copper sulfate, crude oil, cyclohexane, cyclohexanone, diesel fuel, dimethylformamide, dioxane, ethanol, formaldehyde, formic acid, freon, fuel oil, glycerin, glycol, glycentin, heptane, hydrochloric acid, hydrogen peroxide, isopropyl alcohol, lactic acid, linseed oil, methanol, methyl ethyl ketone. Nitric acid, phosphoric acid, potash lye, soda lye, sodium chloride, sodium nitrate, sodium theosulfate, sulfuric acid, tetrahydrofurane, transformer oil, water, xylene, and zinc chloride at 200 Celsius. You should probably print it in PPS. If you've made it this far, you've probably heard of our next material, PEI. You probably have some on your printer, and you should probably subscribe for more 3D printing videos. He called it to action. Have your, has your action been appropriately called? PEI, polyethermide, brand name Ultem, brings that perfect combination of flexibility, heat resistance, strength, and unique property, a surface energy, or I guess a stickiness that changes with temperature. And all those combined make it the perfect material for coating steel print beds. Ultem filaments, there are two of them, uh, share those properties and keep their strength right up to their truly mind-blowing heat deflection temperatures. Ultim 9085 is stronger and easier to print, but Ultim 1010 has a glass transition temperature of 220 Celsius. What? 220 degrees is bananas hot. 220 degrees will roast chicken and fry bacon. 220 Celsius will literally burn your biscuits. PEI is one of the most expensive filaments at 250 bucks a kilo, although it's super high layer adhesion lets you get away with making thinner models. I would not recommend printing this stuff on a PEI coated build plate unless you would prefer for that that part of the build plate no longer be PEI coded. I'd like to give special thanks to matterhackers.com for providing this PEI filament, E3D's testing lab for providing the rest. So without their help, I would have spent the whole series budget right here. So if you're looking for rare filaments, definitely head down there and support the people who support the channel. One step down from the super polymers is the engineering filaments. These print above 250 Celsius, which is the critical point where Teflon starts breaking down and releasing toxins. Even if your printer specs say it goes up to 290, don't go full send with these filaments unless you're packing an all-metal hot end, like the Hemera or the Titan. Let's start with my favorite of the bunch, HTPET+. Fusion Filaments High Temperature PET Plus really needs a rebrand because it sounds both generic and full of marketing wank at the same time. This could not be further from the truth because this stuff claps all the cheeks. For one, this is not PETG. This is BPET or bottle grade polyester. This special blend is intended for blow molding into soda bottles or as real Americans call them, soda bottles. This made one of the most impressive benches I have ever done. Just gorgeous glossy walls superb layer bonding, and the smokestack came out proud and crisp, showing the HTPET Plus, unlike regular PET, stays in place as it overheats. As for downsides, Fusion was not kidding about the high temperature part. HTPET Plus prints at 275 Celsius, making it one of the hotter materials in this list and well past the danger zone of Prusa's, Ultimakers, and anything else with Teflon shoved all up in its spicy bits. If you have an all-metal hot end, this is a robust, super tough printer friendly material that is still cheap enough to be your new daily driver. If you're looking to build nerf blasters, this is exactly what you want to use. What you do not want to use this for is eating food off. So if you fantasize about having your next meal on a tiny plastic boat, then you are looking for Fiberlogy, not Fiberology, CPEHT. This stuff uses high heat to form watertight layer bonds, a super smooth surface, and of course, higher heat resistance than standard PETG. And it's also that this thing can go into this thing. This is a prototyping filament for the food service industry. It is dishwasher safe, it doesn't leach chemicals into your comestibles, and you can sterilize it with bleach, ultraviolet, and commercial steam cleaners. 
I found this stuff to be really easy to print, and if you crank that hog, you can run this much faster than other engineering filaments. CPE HT sagged more than HTPET Plus, but it handled heat buildup just as well, making, it, making the details and the overhangs and the smokestack nice and crispy. The surface finish is super consistent, which is a mandatory feature for anything destined to touch foods. Stay out of my prints, you microbial douchebags. Stay out of my prints, Lebowski. Inland Tough Polycarbonate. This is Micro Center store brand extra strength polycarbonate, except it's not. This is actually Polymaker Polymax Polycarbonate with a new label. That's not a stupid made up brand name, that's a stupid real brand name. Though I guess all brand names are kind of made up, aren't they? Polycarbonate is one of the toughest materials you can print, but in its pure form it warps like crazy. Tough PC or Polymax or whatever you feel like calling it is fortified with what the manufacturer claims are self-assembling aromatic peptide nanotubes and nanospheres. It's a fancy way of saying that they threw some synthetic protein in there to make it melt easier and sag less. You are still going to need an all metal hot end to print this stuff, but to be totally honest, the Nano Baloney makes a pretty nice boat. The last time I claimed I would print every filament, PLA dominated the list, but this time we haven't talked about a single one. We use PLA not because it has big numbers, but because it's easy to print, but we can still optimize for this like our next filament, PLA X3, specifically built for when you gotta go fast. Philoprint's PLA X3 has an extra high temperature range between 190 Celsius and 250 Celsius. Philoprint adds mattifying additives, which I guess you could call mattitives, to instantly crystallize the polymer and limit the warping and delamination that usually happens at high speed. PLA X3 is specified to print at a supersonic 120 millimeters or faster, making it the fastest filament on today's list by a wide margin. This Benchy was printed on my Tool Changer's Volcano Extruder with 100 millimeter per second perimeters and 140 millimeter per second infill, and I'm sure I could have pushed this further. PLA X3 has this nice matte finish, and it's also easier to sand and work than pure PLA. You pay for this performance in money, which is a fairly common way to pay for things, because this stuff costs about 40 bucks a kilo. This is still pr twice the price of mid-range PLA, and you need a reason to buy this stuff. I can see two of those. The first is rapid prototyping, so you can run more iterations per day. And the second is for made-to-order products, so Etsy sellers can offer same-day shipping and keep up with the big dogs. This next one takes the friendliest filament and makes it even more snuggly. Give a hearty buongiorno to possibly the most pleasant printable polymer on the planet. Philo Alpha Alpha Pro. This Italian import loads PLA with a full 20% of additives to support its strengths and cover its weak spots. This spool was a real challenge to find here in the States, but I'm glad I hunted it down because Philo Alpha just completely crushed the Benchy's most nefarious details. Uh, note the angled overhang on the prow, the unsupported arches on the bridge, and that chimney, which again likes to blob up. Uh, all of them came out great, and this stuff even managed to reproduce the text on the stern, and nothing manages to reproduce the text on the stern. Alpha Pro resists ultraviolet light, it doesn't absorb as much water, and you can sand, machine, paint, tap, and glue it. If you need to crank out gorgeous prints ASAP, especially if printing is just the first step of a greater build like a cosplay, Alpha Pro is about the safest choice you can make. The next few filaments extend this goal by fixing the problems of rage-inducing material and unlocking its potential. Nothing exemplifies this more than GF30PP, that's right, the PP is back. X-strand glass-filled polypropylene packs the most phallically acronymized polymer with a ridiculous 30% of authentic Corning brand fiberglass, and that is a combo that should not work. Polypropylene's most important property is that it's tough and it's flexible and you can print super strong watertight parts with a single wall. But fiber fills add rigidity, roughness, and they make the part brittle. Poor qua! Well, pure polypropylene polymer is packed with prodigious properties, but they don't play off each other. It has a slick texture, but it's really soft, which makes it misfeed. It withstands strain and abrasion, but it warps too hard to print accurate mechanical parts. It's got 
fantastic layer adhesion, but it also is one of the saggiest materials, so that just means it fuses to its support material. Fiberglass hardens the PP's trademark flexibility, which reinforces its other properties, literally. GF30 PP retains the polymer's perfect layer adhesion, which makes your part equally strong in all directions. It's isotropic. It's strikingly stiff, but polypropylene's flex still carries through a little bit and keeps it from becoming outright brittle. You also get to tap the lesser known powers of the PP, it's super low density and it's resistance to solvents, adhesives, and outdoor exposure. X-Strand GF30 PP is perfect for projects that need to combine rigidity, lightweight, and resistance to the elements. Maritime, hiking, drones, extreme sports, all these are times when you want polypropylene to be extra stiff. You want stiff, rigid polypropylene. But what if you want a soft PP? then you want filamentum PP2320. Remember how I said that pure polypropylene is a pure poly pain in the ass? PP2320 is a polypropylene blend that reformulates this obnoxious crap into an accessible and easily printable material that produced a truly exceptional benchy and lets you actually use the benefits of polypropylene. It prints slower than regular polypropylene, it's noticeably less flexible, but you still get its trademark superb layer adhesion and a slightly bouncy texture that helps your model resist impacts. This material has a high level of shrinkage as it cools, but come on, which gentleman's PP doesn't? The effect is predictable, it's the same in all directions, so you can compensate for it by just scaling your model up a little bit. Polypropylene has a particularly low density, it resists moisture, it makes watertight prints, and it tolerates heat, chemicals, and high voltages. All this combines with the easy printability to make PP2320 a great general purpose material for industrial prototyping. Polypropylene is also one of the most commonly recycled materials, so you tree-hugging commies can feel less guilty about printing your 17th baby Groot. All this talk about consumerism killing the planet, and yet here you are consuming content. Curious. Last episode, I covered the carbon fiber filled versions of all but two common filaments, and today we complete the cycle. We're going to start with carbon fiber ABS, and I didn't even know that carbon fiber ABS existed. This is not just ABS with carbon fibers, this is ABS with premium carbon fibers. 3DX Tech Crag. Why do I have such a hard time with this? 3DX Tech crammed this acrylobutyrostyrene with high aspect ratio carbon fibers. That means they're extra long, and this is important for this particular material. Even in an enclosure, ABS warps like the USS Enterprise in a Wesley Crusher episode, and it really benefits from a good carbon fibering. The results are truly impressive. Those super long carbon fibers do a great job of stabilizing the polymer, making this one of the nicest looking carbon fiber boats in the harbor. You still get some of ABS lightly flexible toughness to counteract the carbon fiber brittleness. You can solvent weld this with acetone. Nearly any printer with a hard nozzle can run it. I think carbon fiber ABS is an underappreciated material and I would love to get my hands on some carbon fiber ASA for comparison. I was truly impressed with this material. I think it's great. It's not my favorite carbon fiber filament. This was the first filament I wanted to feature in my every filament episode, but this filament was out of stock until literally the same day that episode went live. This filament is advanced, not because of any of its properties, but because of how much I love it. Carbon fiber PETG is PETG with carbon fibers in it, and I love it to an advanced degree. The benefits of any kind of fiber fill are increased viscosity, reduced sagging, stiffer print, and that signature matte finish. And each of these are highly relevant to PETG in particular because they cover all of its weaknesses. You can print any PETG, carbon or not, in two different ways. If you turn the fan off, layers bond almost perfectly, giving you maximum strength, except bridges and overhangs sag like your mom's take. I made that joke last time. If you turn the fan on, your print's undercarriage comes out smoother, giggity, but the part is going to be weaker. However, if you add carbon fiber to the mix, it scaffolds the filament from within, so you get to turn the fan down, get strength and nice finish to have your cake and have someone else's cake too. PETG parts also have an ultra gloss finish that mercilessly highlights every single cosmetic defect to the delight of my nitpicky commenters. But just look at the surface. The carbon fiber hides ringing, it evens out line widths, and it generally gives everything a lovely uniform semi-gloss sheen. My name is Zach Friedman, and this is my favorite filament on the Citadel. Fiberlogy Nylon PA12 plus GF15. 
PA-12 is one of the two nylon polymers commonly used in 3D printing, the other being PA-6. PA-12 is polyamide with 12 carbons, that's what makes it 12. PA-6 is stronger than PA-12, but it melts at a higher temperature. So you're gonna see more of the latter in commercial filaments like this one. All the GF-15 means is that this stuff is 15% glass fiber by, I believe, volume. Glass-filled nylon sounds exotic, but it's actually a really common industrial material, and I 100% guarantee you own something made out of it. Header connectors, integrated circuit capsules, kitchen appliances, power tools, really anywhere a part needs to be tough, stiff, accurate, reasonably heat resistant, cheap, and you need the thermoplastic benefits for usually injection molding. This also makes it a truly excellent 3D printer filament. You see, nylon's main weakness is that it prints hot, but you can't just turn on the fan because it will warp. So heat tends to build up in areas with small cross sections and melt them down, like the bridge and smokestack of this banshee. The glass fibers provide both stability and thermal insulation, which neatly patches this problem and makes what's ordinarily kind of a pain super easy to print. Prints at 260 Celsius, just out of Teflon range, the glass fibers mean hardened nozzle, but this stuff is pretty sick. Speaking of nylon, here is a pretty cool blend that does not sound like it has any nylon in it. Tallman PC TPE. This is not polycarbonate with TPE, it's plasticized copolyamide, nylon with TPE. Damn it, Tallman, you had 676 two letter combinations. I couldn't have been PA TPE. <sighs> Anyways, this blend is really cool. It's stiffer and more printable than pure TPE. It's flexible, but not sticky feeling like TPU. This is a super impact resistant filament. I can't really squish this Benji with my fingers, but it would 100% survive a close encounter of the hammer kind. It kind of bridges the gap between a solid and flexible flexible filament. I had a really hard time identifying good settings for this stuff, but after a couple hours of impotent rage, the boat says everything. Tallman's manufacturing process pre-stresses the PCTPE, which makes the plastic stiffer and feed more consistently than other elastomers. This also gives it the unique property of being stiffer on the spool than after printing. It's pretty neat. It's skin safe composition, silky smooth finish, awesome layer adhesion, single wall strength, and ability to be tie dyed makes PCTPE the perfect filament for all things wearable and prosthetic. We've reached the home stretch, the danger zone. Polyvinylidene fluoride, sold as Florex, Fluorodur, or Kynar, is a distant relative of Teflon. This fluorinated thermoplastic is known for its high purity, gorgeous print quality, extreme resistance to basically everything and the tendency to decompose into hydrofluoric acid, one of the most corrosive and dangerous contact poisons known to man. It poisons women too, and non-binary people. I wanna make sure I'm scaring you the appropriate amount here. PVDF will not start spitting out a super acid that passes through your skin to attack your bones until it's heated to 315 Celsius, which is far above its printing temperature of 255 and actually beyond what most hobbyist printers can even do. The danger zone is actually 290 Celsius, where you only need to be worried about driven out of your workshop by acrid clouds of phenols, hydrogen cyanide, and carbon monoxide. Below 290 though, PVDF isn't just safe. It is probably the safest polymer that you could print. Once it is cool, PVDF barely reacts with anything you'll find outside an organic chem lab. A lot of its properties meet or even beat those 400 degree ultra polymers from the start of the video. Its heat deflection temperature is a searing 150 Celsius. Its abrasion resistance outperforms nylon. It's tougher than polycarbonate. It withstands UV light like ASA, and it can also handle radiation. It's food safe, it's water resistant. It's one of the few filaments that's completely non-hygroscopic, meaning it never ever needs drying. There are two more gotchas. First, the molten plastic attacks steel. This is the only material where you have to switch back to brass or upgrade to a plated nozzle like the Nozzle X. Second, PVDF will rip chunks out of your bed like nothing else. Use extra, extra, extra glue. Don't be stingy with the glue. Don't be me. My poor bed. We've reached the end and I have saved the worst for last. The instant I loaded this filament into Squirtburus, I could tell it was going to dethrone Delrin as the most obnoxious, frustrating, downright sadistic bastard of a filament I've ever tried to print. This could only have been spooled directly out of Satan's candy red balloon knot. This is Triboplus. 
Igliter G260, aka Turbo Plus, is a low friction, wear resistant nylon composite foisted upon a world that never asked for it by the Rhode Island bearing manufacturer Igus. Yep, the very same Igus that makes those super silent linear bearings for your Prusa made a 3D printer filament. They actually made a whole range of filaments. The 100 series is like extra slippery PETG, the nylon based 200 series is what I made the mistake of buying, and the 300 series calls for a 180 degree chamber, a requirement so ludicrous that I had to check if such printers even existed. They do and I'm not buying one. I guess actually developed these filaments for internal use so they could print up custom rollers, bearings, lead screws, and other made to order low friction elements. They opened sales to the general public a few years ago, presumably to twirl their mustachios as the rest of the world suffered with them. Tribo Plus gets its name from the field of tribology. I wish tribology was the study of tribbles, but that falls under the purview of Treknology. Nope, Tribology is the study of rubbing things against each other, and what once occupied the greatest cave-dwelling minds of their generations now deals with friction, lubrication, and wear. Its coefficient of friction is remarkably low, at a mere 0.14 against steel. That blows out the runners-up, PETG at 0.2 and nylon at 0.4. The only thing that could come close is a PTFE filament, which thankfully arrived in the wrong diameter, so I'm off the hook. Turbo Plus can rub against metal 50 times longer than any other filament, and it can scrape against other plastics basically forever without significantly wearing out either one. As nanoscopic fragments of this material flake off, they act as a powder lubricant, which keeps a Turbo Plus print effectively greased up at all times. The reason Turbo Plus should be expunged from the 3D printing community's collective memory is because these properties make it borderline unprintable. It doesn't stick to the bed because it was designed not to to stick to anything. The drive gears slip on it because it was designed to be slipped on. It's a terrible thermal insulator, it prints at 270, it's viciously viscous, which means that it jams whenever the hell it feels like it, and even my non-stick nozzle X was completely boogered up before the second layer was even down. Even after I discovered that Magigoo polyamide could keep this on the bed, I needed like 15 tries just to make it past the prow and 25 to almost finish. I never did manage to get the smokestack to stay attached. By the time I managed to grind out enough of a boat to get usable footage, I had run out of filament, and my life is better for it. Ugh, even this color sucks. F*** this filament. In the next installment, we are going to look at special purpose filaments that make the unprintable practical. We got filaments you can cast bronze into and even grow plants on. Actually testing all these filaments would never have been possible without the Tool Changer, Hemera, Titan Aqua, and Nozzle X all provided by today's sponsor E3D. I've put links in the description so you can buy authentic parts directly from the source to upgrade your favorite 3D printer, or maybe even build four more. Special thanks to MatterHackers.com, America's widest selection of printable plastics, who hooked me up with a huge selection of super rare exotic filaments that you will see especially in future episodes. I would also like to thank Micro Center. Not only did they graciously allow us to monopolize their filament aisle for a shooting session, but they sent me home with some Magigoo inland polycarbonate, enough white PLA to print this huge stack of sample reels and a loop deck which is going to come in really handy because I have to cut like 80 something filament tests. I shall place links to both in this video's seedy underbelly along with some incentives like a free pair of Bluetooth headphones at Micro Center. This episode would have flopped without our supportive is a 3D printing episode support material patrons who funded this quixotic quest. Chief among them are our collaborators Chuck Faduk Smaldong, Jeremy Arnold Sweaty Vag, Command or CMD, I'm not Bedicore, Brian D. Swollen Nut, and introducing. Reagan says if you lined up all the blood vessels in a single human body end to end, they die. I've hidden their names some weaster in this egg episode. Though I'll admit I had to hide Reagan's name separately because it was so long it made things too easy. Let us also give thanks to our lab assistants of generous heart and username Most Silly. These gentle souls include Dylan Welch, Brad Cox, Talon, Democratic Socialist, and a pretty righteous dude, Dash Zack, a blade of kitten, duck distribution specialist, and acquirer of stickers. The Antifa, oh no, it's the Antifa! Daniel Cadwell, protagonist, frantic fanatic, Epon Man, BLM and Friends, my dog is a bear, Olivia Yiptong, Zach, 
SA6HAM, which is their ham radio call sign, I found out. Connor Barnes, Zundo, Chrome Runner, Period Clots, Lydia K, Cats, One Handful of Beans, Zoster, Michael Roche, Kalia, Dance, My Puppets, Dance! Mark Whittington, Ethan Gomez, SXP, Zanforian, TKMK, Nathan Johnson, Robert Burris, Powerful CCH, Roger Pinkham of the, oh, I forgot the name of his theater again. The Great Star Theater. Autismo! Michael Dunn, Taranak, it's 2021, and I still go to my little pony conventions. Bill Schooler, Joe Harp, Guy Gasm, Kevin DeGraff, Bob Dobbington, good suck. Philip Cronom, C. Harris, Rusty Flute, Victor Vaughn, Sir Derpington of Derptopia, Arrow underscore Raider, the world's greatest drone pilot, Bach Grinder FPV, Joe Wilkinson, Nino Gansitano, Transrites, my Yiddish Mama, District 3 Lear, Eddie Tinkerbear, and the indefatigable, yet incorrigible, Varka. Thanks for watching, and remember to join me next time, for I shall squirt for your amusement all over the future.